NVIDIA launched its Kiri architecture in the form of the GeForce 6 series. <laughs> no, not that 6 series. Released in 2004, Kiri was a return to form for NVIDIA after the embarrassing and painful launch of the much maligned GeForce FX series in 2003. Kiri was a fascinating combination of beginnings and endings for NVIDIA. Their first PCI Express native GPU, last AGP native GPU, first 16-pipe graphics chip, and last fixed-function graphics architecture. In this inaugural installment of the Department of Rendering, we're taking a look at what might seem at first to be an entirely middle-of-the-road Kiri GPU, but one that I think represents the architecture's greatest strengths and weaknesses. Welcome to the GeForce 6800 GS AGP. Kiri appeared in two revisions, NV40, which launched the 6 series of graphics products in 2004, and G70, which helmed the 7 series of cards in 2005 and 2006. I first encountered Kiri in the form of a mid-range product, NV43, powering a GeForce 6600 GT AGP that I installed into my overclocked Athlon XPM gaming rig in the summer of 2005. I was upgrading from a GeForce FX 5200, and NV43's ample performance was a breath of fresh air. Near Radeon 9800 Pro performance levels for a mere $129. Kiri achieved this performance through a symmetrical architecture that was as wide as 16 pixel pipelines in NV40, and as wide as 24 in G70. As a bug fix and die shrink of the GeForce FX's Rankine architecture, it broke away from the multi-texture acceleration of NVIDIA's three previous GPUs, and instead focused its die area on a large number of identical parallel pipelines, with one pixel shader and one texture mapping unit per pipe, a layout that had proved quite successful for ATI with their R300 series of GPUs from 2003. Kiri represented the last graphics architecture to adopt this symmetrical layout, with all further designs, even to this day, being massively asymmetrical unified shader layouts. Even ATI's last fixed function architecture, R580, was asymmetrical, with three pixel shading units per texture unit in its highest performance variants, an acknowledgement of the exponential rise in shading workload versus texture workload in games at the time. This means that Kiri plays best with games from 2004 or so and older, and that's a perfect segue into the game spotlight and benchmarks. So let's take a look. Starting in 2002, we have Serious Sam The Second Encounter. This is essentially a DX7 level game, with transform and lighting and multi-texturing its only real hardware features. As such, it's easy to crank up the settings in the advanced options menu and really make this game shine. Morrowind, also from 2002, can also be cranked up to maximum settings on this card, but the resulting frame rates, while perfectly playable, are not as stratospheric as Serious Sam. This much GPU horsepower does buy you some headroom for modding the game, however, and higher poly count model replacers were common by the time this card launched. The final 2002 game I want to look at is Warcraft 3. Its single player campaign, shown here, was capable of running on a potato, but if you were an avid online player, large matches of Defense of the Ancients could bring lesser systems to their knees. <laughs> Moving into the launch year for this card, we have Lord of the Rings Battle for Middle-Earth. I know movie licensed games aren't usually a great time, but I remember picking this up when it was released and being quite surprised at the level of polish and enjoyability in the game. It used Command & Conquer's Sage engine and incorporated a number of RTS quirks that were popular at the time, some of which had been previously pioneered by Warcraft 3, like settlements and hero units. Overall, runs great on Kiri, and a fun game. Moving up to 2005, we have Quake 4. 
I'm not sure what to say about this game. I played the demo back in the day and wasn't really impressed, although the recent review by Civi11 made me realize that Raven kind of buried the lead on this game, requiring the player to slog through a somewhat excessive amount of dark corridors and marine-alike war simulator before getting into the heart of the game, your own strogification. One of these days I might try my hand at a playthrough of this game, but the payoff just doesn't seem worth the effort. The last game on the spotlight list, before we get into the benchmarks, is Oblivion. Released in 2006 and optimized for the Xbox 360, this was the nail in Curie's coffin. The amount of shading in this terrascale optimized game is too much for the old school symmetrical pipelines in the 6800GS, and frame rates drop into the low 30s outdoors, even at 800x600. Dungeons fare quite a bit better, but I remember booting this game up on my 6600 GT back in the day and being quite disappointed with its performance. Truly the starfield of its day. Now the moment you've all been waiting for, the benchmarks. The test system we're using today is my fast AGP test bench, an ASUS P5PEVM motherboard using the Intel 865G chipset. With the fastest CPU it will accommodate in the socket, a Core 2 Extreme X6800. Unfortunately, the board exposes no overclocking control, so the X6800 is running at its stock 2.9 GHz clock. The operating system today is Windows XP, booting from a SATA SSD, and I've got 2 GB of DDR400 RAM installed in the system. Now you might remember a while back that I did a GPU June video where I attempted to benchmark all of my GPUs and plot them on one big performance graph, from the S3 Verge all the way up to my 3080-12 gig. Shockingly, that didn't work out so well. However, that project, as well as two years of running the Cheap PC Challenge, has given me insight into a string of benchmarks that seem to be able to cross multiple GPU generational boundaries and demonstrate relative performance across a wide range of cards and architectures. It's my hope that through these benchmarks we can eventually connect some dots and maybe start plotting cards on a similar kind of one big graph. To that end, I've selected five benchmarks out of my suite for the 6800GS. Two I consider contemporary, and would have been benchmarks used to compare this card to its peers, and the other three are bridge benchmarks, that reach backwards and forwards in time, to correlate with future cards tested on the channel. Let's get started. The first bridge benchmark into the past is Expendable, a DirectX 6 game from 1999. This game punishes a card's pixel and texture pipelines, and can directly compare cards as old as the original Voodoo Graphics and ATI Rage Pro, all the way up to things as new as the Voodoo 5 and the GeForce 256. In the case of the 6800GS, this will have to be a bridge to a bridge, as the small amount of resolution scaling seen here means that I can only really trust the maximum 1280x1024 result as comparable across cards. I'll have to run this on a slower card that's still capable of this resolution to get meaningful numbers at the lower resolutions. Still, impressive results here with hundreds of frames per second rendered even at 1280x1024 in 32-bit color. The second bridge benchmark is also from 1999, and that's Quake 3. This, however, is an OpenGL benchmark, and many older cards have poor or non-existent OpenGL drivers, so again, this will need to be a bridge to a bridge. Still, over 400 frames per second at 1080p using the retail version's Demo 4 is incredibly impressive. The first contemporary benchmark is Unreal Tournament 2003. The demo version of this game ships with a benchmark tool that includes an automated fly-through of the game's two deathmatch levels. It's easy to test and stresses out the rendering pipeline of cards a bit more than expendable. This is technically a DirectX 8 game, but it has a DX7 fallback rendering path, which doesn't seem to do much to the visual quality, so I think this is more of a, a ROP TMU benchmark than anything. I usually try to stay away from older 3DMark benchmarks, since after a certain point they just turn into CPU tests. However, the Battle of Proxicon, a DX8 benchmark nestled into the middle of 3DMark 03, seems to scale fairly linearly with GPU power, even into GPUs far more recently manufactured than you might expect. For posterity, I'll include frame rate results from all four game tests here. The 6800GS sets the benchmark in 3D Mark 03 with over 470 FPS in wins, 
92 FPS in Proxicon, 78 FPS in Trolls, and 68 FPS in Nature. The last benchmark is probably expected and really demonstrates this card's weakness when it comes to newer games. Crisis was released in 2007 and targets DirectX 10, but has a DX9 fallback rendering path for older graphics cards like the 6800GS here. Curie turns in a particularly pathetic performance here with just under 18 FPS at 800x600 medium settings and a paltry 7 FPS at 1680x1050. Ouch. So, what's the conclusion? Well, the 6800GS is a mostly overlooked product these days, making them kind of ideal for folks looking for fast AGP cards for their builds, as most cards faster than this command exorbitant prices on the secondary market. Indeed, unless you're specifically building a fast AGP retro system, Kiri can provide plenty of graphics oomph for games released in its time period. Its major weakness, as we saw, is heavy pixel shading, but it still has uncommon brunt for older, more texture-heavy games that benefit from its comparatively high pixel throughput. Curie is my favorite DirectX 9 graphics architecture, not only because of the fond memories I have of my 6600 GT playing my favorite games at previously unfathomable resolutions and frame rates, but also because I dig its old-school symmetrical design. If you had a Curie card back in the day, or lusted after one while stuck on a GeForce 4 MX or FX 5200, let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear your experiences. If you enjoyed this episode of the Department of Rendering, please tap, click, bump, smash, or detonate that like button. It really does help the video make its way through the godforsaken algorithm that rules our destinies. Thanks a ton for sticking around, and may the PC parts be ever in your favor. Have a great night. <laughs>